welcome everyone to um, Focal Plane Features. So we're really delighted to uh, have uh, Tom, Katrina, Katrina and Maria jo joining us um, for our webinar on um, data management. Um, so yeah, excited to hear what's obviously a really important topic and probably becoming more and more um, important as we have, uh, we're generating more and more, more data um, from uh, our imaging experiments. Um, so yeah, just uh, quickly wanted to say a little bit about uh, Focal Plane. So obviously Focal Plane is our uh, community site um, at the Company of Biologists and Journal of Cell Science. Um, if you haven't been to uh, to the site apart from to register this webinar, I recommend you having a look around. So we have some um, new things coming along online that we're really excited about. So we now have um, the MicroList resource database hosted on Focal Plane. So uh, to find things like this uh, webinar and other um, useful uh, useful resources for data management, for example, you can um, find those within the, the MicroList database. Um, and we're also going to have some new um, features for the cell biologists amongst you uh, coming online soon. So yeah, keep your eyes out um, for that. Um, but yeah, so I guess uh, just leaves me to, to pass on. So uh, Katerina and Tom are going to uh, give their talk. So Katerina is going to talk first, followed by Tom. So if you have any um, urgent questions for Katerina, you can ask them. But generally, I think we'll just take um, uh, questions at the end for, for both of the speakers. So as I said, you can use the question and answer um, tab for asking any um, questions that you might have. And then following the question and answers, uh, Maria is going to give us an introduction to Founding Guide, which is a uh, exciting uh, new initiative that's being managed um, from uh, Eurobio Imaging. So she'll tell us all about that and their um, upcoming uh, meeting as well. So I guess with that, I'll pass over to uh, Katerina to get started. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see it in presentation mode? Yes, it looks good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Caterina Strambio de Castiglia, and uh, I'm very delighted to be here to talk to you about data management. I'm going to tell you uh, more in general about data management, what it what it, does it mean spe specifically for images, um, and what are the advantages and what needs to happen for all of us to be able to, to do this uh, together. Uh, and then Tom is going to give you more um, a more practical guide on on the use of Omero for this purpose. Okay, so first of all, um, we all know that we are dealing with images, and images are complex beasts. So it's not the same as having um, just. Uh, I mean, it's it's the it's. Data management is complex for all type of data, but, but this adds an, an additional layer complexity. Images are multidimensional. There is, they're very big, they, and the data keeps getting bigger. Uh, we, you really need to visualize the data in order to understand it. Uh, so you have to have the proper platforms to do it, um, and you need a lot of computing power. Uh, to to deal with it so and and for all of these to work together and allow us to actually get uh, information and science out of it metadata is really essential and um, metadata is, and so the the whole thing so the important thing is that we need to uh, manage the data together with the metadata and at each uh, different step of the cycle of data life cycle new metadata gets added and that has to be also dragged along and uh, kept together with the data, both in a human readable fashion so that we can, for example, write material and methods, but also in a machine readable fashion so that all of this work can be done for us by computers. And so the way that I like to think about data management is uh, for in general, but for images in particular, is that there are two phases that uh, we need to think about. One is the pre-publication, pre um, which happens every day. And we're already doing it. I mean, we're already keeping track of what we do for the experiments. We already write down notes. But now we have to start thinking about how to do that best in, in on the computer so that th that information is not lost. 
doesn't have to be re-entered multiple times, but we, it can be kept with the images throughout the life cycle. And then if we've done a good job in the pre-publication everyday data management, then when we are when we are asked to to share the data when we publish an article, everything is going to be much easier, and we don't, we don't have to scramble to annotate after the facts. So this is the really the message that I am uh, going to keep uh, this talking about the fact that if we do pre-publication that everyday data management, uh, then this is a gift to ourselves, and and then of course is also a gift to everybody else. So uh, to, to, there is a life cycle. So that's another thing that I'm going to tell you about. Um, so there is uh, the experimental and sample preparation. Then there is the acquisition and then the analysis of visualization. And across all of these different steps, metadata, the data gets generated, but then metadata gets also generated and it has to be maintained and kept together with the data. This is really important also for us while we're doing our experiments. Uh, so instead of thinking that, oh, why am I doing this for other people? Think about it. You're doing it for yourself so that you don't you don't lose track of every, all the hard work you've done. And then uh, once you have also the added advantages, once you have done that, um, then when you have to um, publish, because uh, now uh, more and more funders require this, uh, you're gonna have be in a good position to 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 share it publicly because it will have all the information you need. But despite all of these rosy pictures um, um, I'm depicting, uh, you know, this is considered very difficult and a lot of people are scared. So we're gonna try to make sure that um, at the end of this, you'll feel a little bit less done. It will be less daunting. And I wanna remind you that many different Com uh, countries are now uh, now have uh, policies. Uh, these are uh, you know different countries uh, uh, from Europe to Canada to South America, and then there is the U.S., which is where I am. That has uh, maybe the, is the last kid on the block for finally at having a, a policy at, at, as well. And so um, this is a very nice uh, image that you know tells us also again is it's not just about how our, our our single data, but how we can put the data together, and 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 actually have something really much more powerful when we work together. So the first thing I'm going to tell you a little bit is why research data management is important, what is needed, and then um, how we're going to do it. So the first thing I said is it's a gift to yourself. So um, basically, we all have experienced situation in which you know we are told to reproduce data from uh, a student that has just left, or uh, we have we are we are ourselves uh, have our own lab and a, and a postdoc leaves, and then we we are found in a mess. And so how do we go from this to? a situation in which we can manage the information and the data and then have a very nice uh, organized situation. And in order to have all this organization, we need labels, which, well, we need the data, which is the content of the boxes. We need storage, which is shelving and boxes. We need the metadata, which are the labels. And importantly, we need a forklift, which is the software tool to go and retrieve all of this. And it can only be done if it is, uh, well organized and well uh, managed, so and 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 understandable, uh, with so the labels have to be understandable, and this is important because we want to do open science, which is actually a requirement uh, and it's been recognized as a, as a uh, value for humanity by UNESCO. We want to have fair data, which means we want to have data that we know where it is and how it was produced. Uh, we can control who access it and who ca uh, we can share it with, and then uh, and then uh, we can then figure out who ca what can be done with it, and ideally more data, more more information, more more science can be taken out from it. Um, and also, I wanna there is a great quote I got from uh, our colleagues Josh Moore and Susanna Kunis that AI is becoming much more popular these days, but without fair data. It's just fancy math. So we really need, especially with AI and other analysis like that is going forward, we really need to have um, a, a fair data in order to make sense of all of this. I'm gonna skip through this, um, but I wanna give you an example of um, 
how you know organizing your data actually can give good science and you know can can allow you to do science that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do this is Katie Borner, a close colleague now is becoming a close colleague from HubMap, which is a human biomolecular atlas program, which is a program funded by the NIH. And they have been mapping the, the cells in the in the body of in 20 different um, organs. Um, there is a paper that they just released in which they put together all their data and they have the individual cells, but also different techniques to map the, um, the identity of, of, of proteins and RNA in these cells. And they have uh, developed a um, an atlas to be able to keep track of all these different anatomical structure in one uh, in in one in one um, coordinated fashion. And now we want to uh, integrate with it data from the 4D nucleon, which is another uh, another NIH funded consortium. And all of this can only be done because there is a lot of standardization throughout all of these aspects so that we, we can always know that we're comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges and uh, that we can uh, integrate the data uh, in an efficient manner. All of these data, this could not be done without data management and, and, and standardization. So what is needed to organize all of this? We need strong communities, metadata, open data format, software infrastructure, and persistent identifiers. Um, so, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of these. Strong communities are really important. We need to bring people together to develop consensus. I mean, it's, standards are basically common languages. So we need to have the people that are coming together to work, ad, agree about the common languages. And then the, the communities are also important for advocacy and for making everybody aware, such as, for example, now the company of biologists is helping us uh, tell, uh, reach uh, many people to, to, discuss about, to, to discuss about these topics. There is a big, huge uh, network of, of uh, in, in organization that are around the world. Um, and so if in any country that you are, you can find something that is near you that you could start plugging in. Um, and then um, these tip converge uh, to more global institutions, such as non-institution organizations such, such as Global Bioimages, Globias, uh, and Quare Plimi, which is concentrated on quality and reproducibility for light microscopy. In North America, there is BINA. And so since I'm in North America, I can tell you this example. Um, we are bringing together the three countries in North America. So it's actually, we're very proud to be a trilingual organization. And we are organizing, for example, pop-up um, exchange of experience event with small number of people in which we're discussing uh, things such as this topic. Uh, here you can see me uh, at the Broad Institute with, with Beth Simini uh, to talk about uh, people during the pandemic, uh, talk about uh, data management during the pandemic. Uh, and another thing that we do is we do uh, advocacy. For example, we have submitted a uh, request for information response to the NIH. We have bring together, we have brought out together stakeholders from different companies and and institutions to discuss about it. And we have published a couple of, and we keep publishing opinion papers uh, to, to discuss about these topics. Another piece that is really important is machine actionable metadata. And um, so the image metadata is, um, is metadata that is uh, for both experimental uh, microscopy metadata and analysis metadata. So uh, is, is metadata that comes from all the different uh, stages of the life cycle. And this has to be, right now, it's all over the place in notebooks, in, in log files, and it has to be really organized and made uh, interpretable by the, by the software uh, down the line. So this has, this has to be organized. Then we need uh, open data formats that allow uh, all the different software to read uh, the metadata and the data in an in a, in a organized fashion, in a similar fashion, so that it can all be compared. Uh, and uh, this is an example of a next generation format uh, plan for metadata that is being uh, developed by uh, Josh Moore. And uh, this is uh, an actual Zenodo 
uh, figure if you are interested in, and there is also a little uh, publication about this if you're interested in taking more, uh, a big look, uh, another look about it. And um, I think I'm running, uh, um, what, how, am I, how am I doing with time? Uh, you've you've had about fifteen minutes, slightly okay. less, slightly less. So it depends how long Tom's going to talk for. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm I'm gonna just conclude soon with uh, and pass the ball to to Tom. So software infrastructure is actually the perfect introduction to uh to get then to Tom because we need to have um. So we, I said that we need to organize this metadata. We need to keep it machine readable. We have to organize it with the, um, keep it together with the data. And uh, how to do it is basically by using infrastructure. Uh, and this is where for, we will need help from IT departments. Uh, so typically individual labs cannot really do this alone. Uh, so this is where also it's important to think that all of this has to be done with in collaboration with other people. And um, so Tom will give you a good example about how this can be done specifically with, uh, with Omero. And uh, I will just leave you with these last two slides and to think about why do I need to worry about infrastructure? Um, I like to, to talk about this image in which we all like to, to look at nice fountains, which is in, in this case would be the science. But in order for that, to work, you need to have people building pipes under the fountain so that um, all of this can be then brought in the light and, and have this sparkling, uh, sparkling result. So as a, and, and uh, Tom is gonna tell you more about how we can use uh, the Omero, the Omero uh, platform as a software infrastructure for doing all of this. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Katerina. So yeah, we'll move on to Tom. And the, like we said, we have questions for both Tom and uh, Katerina at the end of um, Tom's uh, talk as well. So um, hold on to those. Okay. Um, so here's my presentation. So thank you, Katerina, for introducing the topic uh, so nicely and well, uh, like you said, um, my presentation then is going to be more about Omero and how it can help you uh, in your day-to-day -day work in the lab. And Katarina mentioned fair data and publishing data, but um, I really think it's uh, also important to say that data management is really here, not just for the fair data, but to help you uh, at your at your bench and in your lab in your lab. Um, so it's, and I also want to convey the point that it's for everyone in the lab. Um, so it's not just the experimenters who have to d deal with the data management and who benefit from it, but group leaders, experimenters, of course, but also bioimage analysts uh, at the end of the line. Um, and to define a bit these roles, uh, the group leaders uh, would be important for him to have this overview of projects, being able to monitor the project. Uh, different projects he has, uh, but it's also about this long-term archiving that when the student leave, he still needs to be able to look at the data and understand the data. Um, on the side of experimenters, they are the one who would uh, create the data and they would also know all these experimental little details when something is not going well in the experiment or, or there's something interesting. So they are able then to annotate the data. They can annotate the data to explain to the others what is happening uh, precisely with um, everything they, they do. And um, at last, we have the bioimage analyst uh, who probably going to need some metadata to perform the processing of data. Um, and he also needs to have convenient ways of sharing the results back with uh, experimenters, group leaders, you know, that it's not just complicated files on the computer that he says, my results are there, but that the other can also look at the results of the analysis. And there's also some kind of need of traceability in the analysis. If you find an outlier in the analysis that you're able to trace it back to the source sample, or the other way around that, when you have a sample, you can find the analysis linked to it. Um, and so I'm going to talk uh, about Omero. Uh, so that's a bioimage 
uh, data management tool we use here at our facility and make available for our users. And if you use Domero before, that's maybe the view you're familiar with. Um, so this is um, uh, an HTML, a web, uh, a web tool in, in which you can review your data. Uh, but that one is uh, actually just this tool called Omero Web that display uh, your resources in a web environment. But the data is coming from a second part, Omero Server, so it's a bit of details. Um, but when you're uploading data to Omero, it's this Omero Server that would have these uh, files uh, stored in your storage. Um, and whenever you want to display them in Omero Web, Omero Web would, uh, through this connection, um, get the data from uh, the server. And while the server has the files, what you're seeing in Omero Web are the images. Um, and I want to point out as well that Omero Web is one of the ways to access data in Omero server, but there's different ways that we're going to see later. Um, so I'm in the shoes right now of a group leader. I'm connecting for the first time. I don't have any data. Uh, this is the uh, my groups, uh, my group. If I want to see data, I would have to go there, uh, open the drop down menu of all the groups I'm part of, and you could find filter data belonging to different people. So you have to already this kind of filtering that you can see per project or per uh, per person. Um, selecting someone, you would get uh, in Omero the list of all the data set you have for a project. Selecting something, you get some thumbnails in the center and on the right, you would get already some metadata. So some information about the image, like uh, the pixel size or the channel names and some other annotation. But uh, uh, I think I, I really like to point to is that button here, which is providing you a link to a resource in Omero. So if I copy this link and send it to someone, um, that person, if he's also part of the group in Omero, if he also have access to the Omero server, will then be able to see the resource. So I can point someone directly to an image or a data set or uh, something else in Omero. I don't have to send him data or something like that. Um, but Omero is uh, mainly for organizing data. Uh, so we are now in the shoes of an experimenter. And I like to make this analogy. I also like analogy. Um, and I'm taking this example. I have a collection of books on biology. Uh, what librarians love to do, well, sorting the books by author alphabetically. I think that's a standout for them. Um, just because it's easier to go find the data, uh, the book, <laughs> when when you know the name of the author. But maybe some other people would like to sort of arrange the books differently. Maybe you'd like to arrange them by species, if you're only interested about certain species or subtopic of cell biology, ecology, evolution. It's maybe also a bit hard to organize uh, books this way because books would not be only belonging to a single topic or about a single species. But we have, we need to have a way yeah, to, with the card for the book, we could then search for the books. Um, going back to Omero, um, we are now in this explore tab. And this for me would be my collection of data, my collection of book, uh, if you want. I also um, name my data set starting uh, with the date. So they also appear chronologically, a bit like the library and sorting them by author. Um, but now if I want to have this kind of other view like per species or per uh, topic, what I'm using in Omero are the tags to organize um, my collection of data. Um, in this case, it's a master module uh, uh, project. So we have data sets from master students and how would master students like to organize their data per the microscope they use, per the group of student, per the day of the course or the topic. Um, and now instead of looking at the whole collection of data I have, I can switch tab here and go to the tags and display all the tags I have. So the tags here that are organized in this tag set, so tag collections. And if I um, open, look at what's inside my tag, this is where I would find the data set that were annotated uh, with the different tags. So a data set that is um, here under group two, I would also find it under day one. So it's different view you can have on your collection of data. 
Um, and you would have this plugin here called Tag Search. You can have installed by your administrator on your mail server, um, for which you, which would be a tool to help you combine tags. So starting from group two, you would get the list of all data set belonging to the group two. You start typing the next tag name. It proposes you only the tag available uh, remaining in that list of data set, and you could do more advanced filtering like that. And it's somewhat like browsing your folders on your computers, but in a more flexible way in a way. Um, and now that I found my data set, so the tag would help me find the book I was searching for in my library. This would be the detail card. Um, so the annotations, detailed annotation about what the data set is about. Um, so what I'm displaying here are annotation we put. So I'm selecting an image right now and I'm showing the annotation we put on the whole project um, and on the data set. This list you're seeing here uh, is um, an, an adaptation we did of the recommended metadata for biological images. So recommendation of what kind of metadata to keep track of. Um, and well, um, this is quite a complete list uh, describing my different data sets. Um, but once you have done that work once, um, it's something you can apply to the next data set. So you're doing replicates of your experiments. Uh, so you can copy and paste uh, this annotation. So you would have here tools in the middle to copy paste uh, this list of annotations. Um, if this is not sufficient, you could have scripts on your server to then um, work from uh, Excel. So populate annotation in a CSV format and import it in the middle. Or the other way around, you could export your annotation to CSV, rework on them, uh, etc. So all this annotation, um, it's some work you have to uh, initiate. But if you're doing it day after day, experiment after experiment, this is uh, something well easier to uh, to do. And in the end, you would get very well annotated data set that would help you for your ultimately to publish your data. Um, we are back to our schema uh, with the different Omero components. And what Omero Web here has is this connection to the server. So in a way, it's a gateway to access data in the server. And what people do is to create plugins for Omero Web so that benefit from this connection between the web and the server to add more features uh, to this Omero Web interface. So one, we already seen the tag search here that helped us find data set. And I want to show you the two as a here so the first one, a viewer. So you have a viewer in the web, uh, a Mero web, to go through uh, your data. So here I'm showing a stack going through. I'm opening the same stack uh, five times and only turning one channel at a time uh, for the different images I have here. So that now when I lock uh, the panel together, um, I will be able to move in the images at the same time so I can if I have uh, many different channels, I can look at them together, scroll through the stack at the same time. And well, this is a viewer. You can view your data in the web. You don't need again to send your images um, to your collaborators. The second tool, a mirror figure, which is uh, if you've tried it before or explained um, Omero and a mirror figure to someone, you would know that this is one of the best selling point for Omero. Uh, it's a very convenient way of creating figures uh, from your data. So here we have an histolo histology images from which I create this kind of insets. So uh, taking this area and I would, uh, you could very easily um, display the zoomed versions. Um, here another example from uh, this stack in fluorescence microscopy, where I display different depth of the stack and for different channels, where these values are also populated automatically for, by Omero figure by reading the metadata out of Omero. So the metadata we have in Omero, we can use uh, and display it in, in our figure. Um, again, another important thing for me here is the link to the figure. So when you create a figure in Omero, in Omero figure, you have a link you can share with someone. So instead of exporting as a PDF here and sending it again via email, you could just send the link to your PI and the PI would see 
the same data and it would have all the link again to your um uh, to your data sets annotation etc um and i was talking about metadata here's another example where i did my duty of annotating all my data sets uh, taking the time for that now I'm displaying images in a mirror figure, and these are things I can populate from this key value pair from the annotation. So the work you're doing of annotating, organizing is something you can benefit from later on um, in different things like a mirror figure. Um, and we are now going to look at the point of view of uh, from the point of view of a bioimage analyst uh, arriving on a mirror. There's data that has been added by the experimentalists. Um, and as I said, there's not only Omero Web that is connecting to Omero Server, but we could, from Fiji, also have a plugin connecting to Omero Server, or from QPass, or from Python, so different client you can have to connect. And uh, a thing I haven't mentioned, but Omero also comes with a database that is organizing all the data and metadata and all the links between all the different resources. And uh, a programmer, bioimage analyst, can really then go and retrieve this metadata and data to perform his analysis. So to have a, a quick look on the API, so in Fiji, the, it comes in the form of a plugin, where you would have in your plugins this Omero button to connect to Omero, giving you a graphical interface. You, once you detect ROI in the image you get, you could then save them back to Omero with a simple button like that. If you're more of a programmer and you like um, writing macros, you could write macro and process uh, your data set connect to Mero as well. Um, if QPass is your tool, then you would also have this extension. And well, for Python, this is what it would look like. And I'm uh, highlighting here different extensions and those three have been developed by the community. So it's also the community that helps uh, improving Mero and uh, uh, yeah, adding adding tools uh, to uh, to it. Um, and now let's put everything together. So um, this is our database. Uh, we're starting. Um, this is coming from uh, the OME model. So describing how different components are linked to each other so that images belong to a data set, that ROI can be attached to an image. Uh, the instrument that have uh, different properties. So this is a whole model that uh, 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 represent the database. And I'm an experimentalist. I'm feeding images to my database. I'm getting image uh, out of it, um, adding more images, making my database grow. So maybe now I need to add organization with project data set. Everything you're going to do is going to add um, organization information inside this database. Maybe now I want to also add annotation. My PI is going to come review what I'm doing or is going to add more annotation that of things you know himself, adding that to the database, um, making this whole thing grow. And our bioimage analyst would come, um, take the images inside Fiji, make image analysis and extract out of it ROIs and measurement for these ROIs. And that's something you would feed again back to the database, attach them to the images. So this results here, what it, um, this is what it looks like in Omero. So I'm back in the viewer um, and you can see the ROI someone uh, has done in Fiji attached to an image, so detection of nuclei. And if someone else did the image analysis, now I could come and review for this image the results of my analysis. Again, we have a tiny link here. If there's a particular ROI that has some interest, I could again show it, share it with someone and someone would directly see this ROI in his web browser. Um, and about measurement, this is the form it can come in in Omero. So it's a Omero table where what you have here are IDs of data set and images, which are also links. So if I find an outlier value here in the measurement, I could trace it back to the ROI or to the image, et cetera, et cetera. And so you would do your analysis, add everything um, back to your server. And once that your server, uh, all your project is complete, that you have analyzed all your data set, um, is the time to put everything um, 
get all the data out. So you could again use Python to uh, and use this library pandas. If you don't know what that is, you get this kind of data frame. So a huge table out of everything. So think about using different condition. For every condition, you have different replicates. For every replicate, uh, every data set, you would have uh, multiple image per data set and every image you detect multiple ROIs. So all that you put together in a big table, do some filtering analysis uh, on that table to then display with this library Seaborn to have very fancy graphs that would help you understand um, what's happening in your experiment. And that would close, um, well, the whole, the whole uh, pipeline. Um, so to conclude, um, I really want to emphasize it's for everyone in the lab. It's not just the experimentalist who has to use a Mero, but um, the PIs and bioimage analysts would really benefit from using that. Um, and it's really here to help you exploring and understand your own data. You have this remote access, so you can, um, well, also for sharing, it's uh, convenient. Has this traceability because every resource is linked to another. And uh, if you add things to this database, then other people can create uh, application um, to, well, add features to Omero, so to say. Uh, so something like Omero, feature, uh, Omero figure um, is uh, really a plus than working with your data. And I would like to thank uh, everyone I'm working with, so everyone from my facility, uh, my working group, the i3D Bio, and well, many more people I'm interacting with from German Bioimaging and FDI, uh, the OME team as well. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Katrina and Tom. Um, so yeah, as I said, we can take some questions now. And then after that, we're gonna hear from uh, Maria about um, founding guide and uh, I recommend you attend their event, which I think Marie is going to, to mention in her talk. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, then uh, please add them to the question and answer tab. Um, I guess I, I had a, a question um, uh, regarding, can, so you talked about the kind of the end of the, the life cycle and uh, Katrina talked about making sure our data is available. So is there a way to, easily transfer this kind of information to something like the bio image archive as well. So um, can you can you do that via Amiro? Yeah, so um, I don't know if Thomas will probably add something, but that's the whole idea is that, uh, for example, uh, Tom just explained how you can at the end download everything. Um, and if, if everything has been annotated, for example, with uh, with the recommended uh, metadata for bioimages, which is RAMBI, um, then um, this is going to be compatible with uh, data that, with the, the standard that is used for bioimage archive. So it's going to be possible to transfer it. Um, I don't think there is a button yet that you can press and transfer, uh, but there are a lot of different... Um, there are different um, uh, community members uh, that are actively at work to to make sure that this can happen. Yeah, from so there's someone who developed uh, a, a command to export the data out of Omero in you know bio for, uh, bio archive compatible format, so Omero transfer from Eric Atamero, so helping package things. Um, but overall, so you have data that is organized and that you can programmatically access. So it's also easier to put things together and have annotation in a consistent way rather than go picking your files yourself and noting down the name and uh, tracking things like that. So because it's structured, it's easier to extract overall. Okay, great. And so then we have a question asking, um, when people add information to the database, does it get labeled so you know who has added that information? So yes. Um, Everything, every object someone creates, it belongs to a user. So you would know who does uh, what work. Yeah. So okay. it's yeah, for collaboration. Okay. And then um, we have a question asking about connectivity in the other direction. So does, so the Amira system looks fantastic. And can you interact with um, other systems, for example, your electronic notebook? So I guess there's a way to um, insert all the uh, annotations you were talking about. Um, can you connect with um, electronic uh, lab books or LIMS? Yeah, so um, it, 
So it talks about replacing it. So mm-hmm. it wouldn't replace it because, uh, you know, electronic like notebook would, for example, keep track of much more, many more details about, you know, you know, your the experiment you have to do, but the it would be a, a link to it. And um, people in, um, Tom can speak about, uh, I know that there is definitely work being done to increase this connectivity. Right now, again, it's not something that is, there is a button right now, but it's it's definitely something that is being, is being worked on by the community. And right now, so we are using eLab FTW in HHU. And what I would tell people is to, put a link from one to another. So at least you could trace them back, but there's no direct connection. And that also has to do that. Well, there's different lab notebook and there's no standard way to communicate with all of them. Yeah. Um, so this is also something that has to uh, improve, but one, hopefully we get there that we can get the metadata in the eLab and that would be read directly for Mero and the, the other way around. But that's definitely that the vision. And yeah. And uh, and what I want to emphasize here is the importance of communities for making sure that these things happen because communities can you know can do advocacy so that there can be more awareness about the importance of these connections and then for example somebody have has heard this seminar and starts talking about it in their institution and say oh wouldn't it be great if we could connect to Omero and then the IT department would maybe start hearing about it so this is. Uh, really the importance of uh, working together so that everybody goes in the same direction. And and that's part of the, the work we are doing to talk with it, with as many people as possible. Okay, I guess, so that's related to another question. So I'll skip and then I'll come back to the to, to earlier one. So it says, I'm a computational biologist. I wonder how easy it is to deploy a MRA server. A MRA server sorry. Um, so this is more something done at the institute level. So it's not the kind of tool you would deploy just for your lab. It's possible, it's open source, it's free. Um, but this is still uh, a piece of work. So a server to maintain, makes make accessible for others and manage large volume of data. So it's still, well, something where you would have to collaborate with the IT of your institute for uh, deploying or someone for managing. So it, it is still some work uh, for that. Um, or at the yeah. very least, you have to have a dedicated person in, in your group, which is not something that most people would be able to do. So this is, the again, uh, so in our institution at UMass, for example, we, we ran the server for a while in from my lab, but now finally is is being taken up by, by IT, which makes it so much uh, better for everybody involved. So yes, it's not something that everybody would deploy on their own, definitely not on their own machine. And and you know only very large labs can have it for their for their individual labs. But I would but highly nothing recommend stopping it. Is not nothing yeah. stopping it because as uh, there was a question, is it open source? Yes, yeah. it's open source, which doesn't mean it's free though, because it, a lot of money was put into developing it. So it's free for the user, but it wasn't free to produce. I, I just want <laughs> to emphasize that. Because um, this is, again, part of what we need to all be aware of, that this piping, this software needs to be built and we need to support the people that build it. And we start, we need to keep thinking about them uh, as, as an integral part of science, an integral part of what we're doing is we need these people like Tom that do all this work in the background so that we can, we can do the, have the nice fountain. But if you want to install it and you're stuck, go to Image SC and there will be people to help also get you started. Perfect. Um, and then we have a question about, uh, I guess, the uses of it. So how do you encourage or enforce users to add metadata to their images or data sets? And this person is saying that their data is piped automatically from the microscopes to Amiro. So annotation later is is harder. Do you have any top tips on that? So um, a lot of us are developing tools to to facilitate that. Um, but at, so as far as the transfer from the microscope to the to the to Omero, in part that's already done because it's uh, it's you know whatever is already present as metadata on the header of the file gets read by by Omero. The more difficult part is the experimental part, and the user will st- still at some point have to enter it. I think where we are. 
really have to work to advocate is they're entering anyway. And often they have to write it multiple times anyway. So, you know, often it's, it's very rare that a user only enters one information once. They will have to write it in the notebook and then they have to write it in the material and methods. So the idea is that it's already been done, but it's been done in a disorganized fashion that doesn't serve anybody. So it's not really the, the idea of adding work, but doing work a little bit different, which sometimes can be scary. That's why we are here to try to make sure that people are less scared. So that, for example, you enter it in uh, templates uh, are, are are shared by other members of your lab or the community so that now they are similar to each other. And instead of you having your own Excel spreadsheet and the other one has in their own, there is a similar template. And then this information can be transferred to Omero's key value pair or tags like T Tom discussed. What Great. we're trying to do also is uh, really guiding the user. So someone new come and we would uh, give him also a template of annotation, like give him all the resources that he would be able to start it from the beginning, but then forcing them, <laughs> you can try to help them as much as you can, but force them not. <laughs> Excellent. So we had a few questions that other people have been uh, kindly answering on the Q&A as well. So thanks for that. So I'm just going to go for one more that hasn't been, which is uh, hopefully a relatively simple one. Uh, and then we'll go and hear from uh, Maria, which is uh, how much storage space can each user have? Is there any limit? No, that only depends on the hardware that is, is I mean, let's say you're a, a avail, you are, uh, have decided with your IT that this is good. I mean, that is going to be done. Then there is going to be like some hardware, like Tom showed that there is the web client and then there is a server server is based on is is sitting on hardware that has some storage so that will very much depend on the policies that are decided by the university uh to you know as 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 much uh, so there is no limit per se but tom can speak to more more on that and if it's about defining a limit for a single or for user giving a, a quota for user um it's quite tricky i would say but there's different way you can assign different storage to different groups. Um, but this is in the configuration of your of your server of your virtual machine. It's more well more IT involved. Okay, great, thanks. So yeah, um, I'll include some of the questions that are on the Q and A tab when we post the the webinar online. So I'll I'll link, include and get some more information from Tom and and Catherine there because we're going to move on to hear from uh, Maria. So we've heard lots about community and I think uh, Maria's gonna talk about a fantastic community that's just building and the uh, kickoff event is coming up soon. So yeah, over to you, Maria. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before I shoot another shiny European project name to you, I would like to tell you why do we need a guide, which stands for the, found, the guide in the founding guide and guide means a global image data ecosystem. So, so far we talked about, um, I mean, Tom and Katerina, they touched the Omero database, which is more into the, the way it was presented today, more like an institutional database, which is probably uh, close to the institution members. But when we think about open image data resources that are already populated with uh, image data and you are a user and you want to access this data, you are isolated because all these image data resources are isolated. They each describe their data in their own way. And as a user, you have to interact with each of them individually. And this is where a global image data ecosystem would come in very handy for a user because we can add a layer of interoperability on top of these already existing image data resources. And this would mm, contribute to what we call fair data. So to have fair data, we need it interoperable. And right now it's not so much the case, especially when it comes to the open image data resources. And here we talk about um, image archive, like Biome Image Archive, IDR, uh, Cancer Imaging Archive, or SSBD, or so on. And Founding guide, uh, founding guide main aim is to increase this interoperability and enable image data sharing together with the community for the biological and preclinical image data. 
by agreeing to a set of metadata and ontologies that is enough to describe the uh, already existing data in these international image data resources. And what Founding Guide is, uh, is a consortium. We have over, uh, we have seven partners in three continents. So we have uh, research infrastructures from Japan, from Australia, and of course, from Europe. It's a two and a half years project. Right now it's founding. So we are just laying the basis of this ecosystem and it's founded by the European Union and coordinated by Eurobioimaging where I am part of. And because this is such a huge community effort, um, we will have three main events happening throughout the span of the project. And the first event is coming up uh, now at the end of October uh, in Japan. It's a back-to-back -back event with Global Bioimaging, another amazing uh, opportunity to learn more about image data across the globe. And Founding Guide community event is then followed by a technical event. And one day is full on Omero workshop. Unfortunately, the technical event is it's gonna be only in person, but the community event, which happens um, at uh, the end of October, beginning of November, is gonna be one and a half uh, days uh, event. It's also hybrid, so you can already register. If you can be in person, that would be even more awesome. Then next year we'll uh, be in Australia, in the other part of the world, because this is a global effort. And we are just laying the foundations, but soon we hope to include also the Western Hemisphere. And at the, the end of the project in 2026, we'll, we're gonna be in Europe. So if you want to hear more about the project and how you can be involved as a community, because again, we are not the first ones trying to tackle this problem. And it's a, really a community effort. It necessitates a lot of coordination. So uh, the community means anyone who's generating, who is using uh, data or who is handling data, image data in any way, it's part of the, of the guide community. So uh, I am the scientific project manager for this project. And any questions you have, you can just uh, look me up on the internet and yeah, just shoot an email. And I think that's it. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to see. Great. So yeah, um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Marie. So if anyone has any uh, quick questions now, we can take them now. Or yeah, as, uh, I'll put uh, Maria's contact information on the the webinar that uh, the recording of the webinar, so you can uh, come back uh, to that as well. Uh, so yeah, I guess uh, thank you. Um, fantastic presentations um, from all of you, and yeah, really nice to have kind of a hand hold <laughs> hand holding approach to take us through the kind of uh, beginnings of uh, data management and and also hearing about its importance and how it can help um, us in our day-to-day -day lives as well as when we're thinking of the publication so thinking about it at, at different levels I think is uh, really important so yeah as I said we've recorded this uh, webinar so we'll be sharing that I think um, when I create the page there's also opportunity for people to comment on there so if anyone has any further questions then you can comment on that page and I'll pass them over um, and so yeah um, and as Tom mentioned, then um, there's a channel on image.sc where you can ask questions. I think that's correct. Is that right, Tom? Where you can ask questions about um, Amiro. Um, and also you can search what other people have asked, because I guess there's a lot of common questions that come up. So yeah, that's a really fantastic resource. Katrina. Yeah, and... yeah I just want to also pitch uh, the resource that uh, an FDI for bioimage from Germany has produced on Zenodo mm -hmm. uh, that has a lot of videos. Uh, that are very well made uh, about Omero, a lot of, uh, and so they are, I really want like people to, so there is a, a link there from Christian, uh, mm -hmm. from there I think you can find others, um, and maybe uh, Tom uh, can uh, share the link with you so that you can put it together with that page. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so yeah, um, thanks oh, everyone. Here. Christian already po just posted it, I think. Okay. Yes. Yes. This is the YouTube channel. Perfect. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I hope they're all in the um, micro list as well. So if you need to search them up again, if you lose them, then they're there as well. So uh, yeah. Um, as I said, thank you very much. And yeah, it's uh, everyone thank keep you. talking, I guess is the important thing. So yeah. Thanks very much. Bye.